Hello, my name is Dr. Paul Finger. I'm the director of the New York Eye Cancer Center and a professor of ophthalmology. My specialty is the diagnosis and treatment of ocular tumors, orbital diseases, and ophthalmic radiation therapy. Part two of this series will build on what we learned in part one. There, I demonstrated how the retinal pigment epithelium blocks imaging of the choroid and thus how a pre-retinal tumor, endophytic retinoblastoma, can be seen to have a double circulation because it is located anterior to the retinal pigment epithelium. I strongly recommend your viewing part one of this series to understand the fundamentals and role of imaging in ophthalmic oncology. Photography is a foundational element for my eye cancer practice. Whether the tumor is located on the eyelid, conjunctiva, iris, ciliary body, retina, choroid, or optic nerve, there's nothing more telling than comparative imaging. Sometimes it is comparing an older image versus a current image for change. Other times it's correlating the OCT, fundus autofluorescent imaging, or angiographic pattern with color images. Multimodality imaging is integral to patient care. That is why at the New York Eye Cancer Center we have 55-inch high-resolution screens in each examination lane to help examine and show patients their tumor and related findings. For example, there's nothing like showing the retinal hemorrhages and cotton wool spots to help explain the presence and necessity of treatment for radiation maculopathy, or having a patient see their choroidal melanoma regress to scar. So, let's start with imaging of choroidal nevus versus choroidal melanoma. Choroidal neva can be brown, gray, green, or even yellow. They can have drusen and or drusenoid retinal pigment epithelial detachments on their surface. Both suggest the tumor has been present for some time. But the drusenoid retinal pigment epithelial detachments are more transient and metabolically active than drusen. Choroidal nevi can demonstrate a blue dome or blue discoloration over the apex, which is consistent with thinning, erosion, or atrophy of the overlying retinal pigment epithelium and Brooks membrane. The blue dome changes also indicate that the nevus is actively affecting an overlying tissue, the retina. Lastly, choroidal nevi can exhibit orange pigment lipofuscin and even subretinal fluid. It is important to know that lipofuscin is a nonspecific metabolic side product of cell death. There exists melanolipofuscin, and its presence indicates a destruction of a melanocyte or melanocytes. It's another sign of metabolic activity. Lastly, choroidal nevi can leak. The presence of visible subretinal fluid suggests there exists either choroidal neovascularization and or incompetent neovascular tumor blood vessels. Most choroidal nevi are benign and present as minimally elevated, moderately well-circumscribed tumors. This one has a few scattered overlying drusenoid retinal pigment epithelial detachments. However, be careful to photograph all pigmented intraocular tumors with the same amount of light. As you see here, despite all these photographs being taken on the same day, the light intensity appears to change the size. This is particularly important when comparing images to monitor for tumor change over time. On the left, a fundus photograph shows a choroidal nevus with overlying gross orange pigment lipofuscin blue arrow. Right, after 15 years of observation alone, note that the tumor size has not changed, but the orange pigment lipofuscin is seen in different locations. Choroidal nevi can leak, but subretinal fluid is the most ominous sign that a nevus is likely a small melanoma. It indicates that the tumor's neovascular blood vessels are incompetent or there may be a component of choroidal neovascularization. Fluorescein angiography and optical coherence tomography are indicated. 
follow such lesions closely for evidence of growth or change or worse, malignant transformation. Hard drusen are not considered to suggest malignancy. They are often seen on a tumor surface, but also, as in this case, the surrounding retina. Hard drusen are considered to be a byproduct of retinal metabolism. Fluorescein angiography of a choroidal nevus is likely to show a pattern of mottled hyperfluorescence. Now, why would that be? This pattern suggests that the nevus is causing a disturbance of the overlying retinal pigment epithelium. It's changing its ability to block fluorescence. Consider that choroidal nevi can be located in different positions within the choroid, thus affecting the amount and change of overlying tissues. In this case, we see a blue dome over the apex of the tumor. Focal fluorescence is caused by a breakdown in the overlying retinal pigment epithelium and Brooks membrane. Focal fluorescence can herald a breakthrough and a mushroom-shaped choroidal melanoma. Focal fluorescence is a risk factor for malignancy, so when you see this sign, look for interretinal and or subretinal fluid as well as orange pigment lipofuscin. Clinically, on optical coherence tomography and fundus for autofluorescent imaging, these factors are more easily seen. Another intraocular angiographic technique is endocyanine green, or ICG. It offers a deeper look through the retina into the choroid. However, pigmented tumors will also block ICG fluorescence. Certain tumors, for example, metastatic choroidal tumors, have poorly formed blood vessels and thus poorly perfuse even with ICG angiography and appear hypofluorescent. In the early phase ICG, we see blockage of the normal choroidal pattern, peripheral hypofluorescence, and a central absolute hypofluorescence. In the late phase ICG, we see silhouettes of the large normal choroidal vessels with persistence of the hypofluorescent central area corresponding to the choroidal nevus. Even in the late phases, pigment blocks fluorescence. In conclusion, choroidal nevus fluorescein angiography will reveal normal, blocked, or increased modeled hyperfluorescence. Focal fluorescence is seen with a breakdown of Brooks membrane and the RPE, as well as tumor-associated choroidal neovascularization. Endocyanine green will reveal larger basal dimension tumors, but no retinal characteristics. Now let's turn to choroidal melanoma. Choroidal melanomas arise in the uvea beneath the retina. Therefore, some tumors are discovered resident beneath Brooks membrane and the retinal pigment epithelium. Others break through Brooks membrane and RPE to extend or mushroom beneath the relatively translucent retina. These breakthrough subretinal tumors typically create the largest secondary exudative retinal detachments. Rare subretinal tumors continue to erode through the retina and extend into the vitreous, causing seeding. In the left fundus photograph, this choroidal melanoma demonstrates the pathognomonic characteristics of choroidal melanoma. Note the arc of gross orange pigment on its surface. And beneath the exudative retinal detachment, the B scan on its right confirms its mushroom shape, low internal reflectivity, and thickness greater than 2 millimeters. Clearly, this melanoma satisfies my mnemonic most, where melanoma equals orange pigment, subretinal fluid, and thickness more than 2 millimeters. I invite you to see my YouTube lecture on most. The URL is on the slide. In this quick summary slide about most, where melanoma equals orange pigment, subretinal fluid, and thickness greater than 2 millimeters, we see that orange pigment is best seen on fundus autofluorescent imaging. Subretinal fluid is best seen on OCT, and I might add on three-dimensional reconstruction. Thickness greater than 2 millimeters is still best measured by ultrasonography. Other risk factors include proximity to the optic nerve, symptoms, and most importantly, growth. 
but for differentiating small melanomas from large choroidal nevi or suspicious choroidal nevi, you can use the mnemonic most. Turning to fluorescein angiography of choroidal melanoma, it is a choroidal tumor. Therefore, we expect early choroidal filling, but like a choroidal nevus. We expect to see modeled hyperfluorescence of smaller tumors, which are trapped beneath Brooks' membrane and the RPE, again, like a choroidal nevus. We see orange pigment and pigment blocks fluorescence. Therefore, orange pigment will also block fluorescence. Once the tumor has broken through Brooks' membrane and the RPE, we're likely to see a double circulation. We can also see formed blood vessels within and on the tumor. Microaneurysms will be best seen on fluorescein, but they're not a huge component, but they should be present or are often present. Like most choroidal tumors, there will be late diffuse staining, and many of the characteristics that we look for will have passed in the early phases of the angiogram. Subretinal fluid is typically hyperfluorescent, as you will see in the upcoming slides. Note that one of the formed blood vessels is depicted by the blue arrow. This tumor has broken through Brooks' membrane to reveal its vasculature. Clearly formed tumor blood vessels should not be seen in a choroidal nevus, and interestingly, neither in a metastatic choroidal lung or breast cancer. During the early phase angiogram, that same blood vessel is seen to cross beneath the overlying retinal blood vessel. This is demonstration of the classic double circulation. But as one also sees in the late phase angiogram on the right, diffuse intratumoral fluorescence hides that finding. This emphasizes the need to photograph the early phases of the study. Also note that the serous exudated retinal detachment is mildly hyperfluorescent. Here, on the left, we see a color photograph of an anterior uveal melanoma. Its relatively amelanotic surface reveals multiple formed intrinsic tumor blood vessels. Fluorescein angiography reveals even more formed tumor blood vessels. But what does the presence of the large formed blood vessels tell us? This finding suggests that unlike other choroidal tumors, this melanoma grew over a significant period of time, which has yet to be investigated. Another common use of photography in ophthalmic oncology is to evaluate and show how tumors change over time. In this case, a finger's slotted plaque was used to completely encircle the circumpapillary choroidal melanoma on your left. The, left, the right photograph depicts the tumor's diminished size as it reveals the underlying optic disc. Also note that the tumor is darkened, consistent with good tumor control. With periodic intravitreal anti-VEGF suppression, the optic nerve function was preserved along with the patient's visual acuity. So let's take a look at another choroidal tumor, choroidal hemorrhage. I'm sent a number of choroidal hemorrhages over the year to rule out choroidal melanoma. Choroidal hemorrhage, however, is not a malignancy, it's just blood. However, some rare choroidal melanomas can also present with choroidal hemorrhage. In general, for choroidal hemorrhages, blood layers out between the choroid and the retina. That blood blocks choroidal fluorescence. The blood highlights the retinal circulation, much like RPE hypertrophy. And any CNV that is synchronous with the choroidal hemorrhage, or maybe even etiologic, is hyperfluorescent. Note the fresh hemorrhage at the edge of the tumor, at the end of the arrow. This is a very uncommon finding for choroidal melanoma, or metastasis. Now note the quote, blackout sign, close quote. This is almost pathognomonic for a choroidal hemorrhage. The blood is blocking out the normal choroidal fluorescence. 
Like RPE, hemorrhage blocks the normal choroidal fluorescence. But how do we differentiate RPE hypertrophy from choroidal hemorrhage? Well, with RPE hypertrophy, there should be no signs of hemorrhage, no blood, no exudate, no serous fluid. The RPE lesions' edges are more sharply demarcated, and the lesions should be raised. In fact, OCT is particularly helpful to view what lies beneath the RPE. Though we will be going in-depth on OCT in a subsequent lecture, as a clinical pearl, I suggest you investigate the edges of a suspected choroidal hemorrhage with OCT. There you will see a unique finding of an abrupt transition from normal to abnormal and uplifted retina. Unlike infiltrative choroidal tumors, with fusiform extension beneath a relatively normal appearing retina, the choroid adjacent to the choroidal hemorrhage appears entirely normal. This is Dr. Paul Finger. Part 1 of this series covered the basics of photography and angiography using ocular tumors. Part 2 covered photography and angiography of choroidal nevus, melanoma, and choroidal hemorrhage. I now invite you to see part three of this series on metastatic choroidal tumors, hemangioma, and osteoma. This series of lectures has been supported by the Eye Cancer Foundation. The ECF has supported research revealing new methods of diagnosis and treatment for choroidal melanoma and other ocular tumors. It has also supported the AJCC staging systems, which gave us a common eye tumor language for ophthalmic research and patient care. But we need your help to keep achieving. Thank you for your attention. I now invite you to view part three of this series and to visit the Eye Cancer Foundation at eyecancer.com.